see on your screen now, we'll be looking at how AI is set to impact legal education. Of course, that is the theme of uh, today's webinar. But then I would also like to tell you a little bit about what skills may be necessary for tomorrow's lawyers and how we can kind of try to think about uh, what will make us relevant and necessary as an industry uh, going forward. And uh, what are some of the key takeaways from the legal educators and also uh, the young lawyers of today? So I hope this kind of covers the topic that we are here to discuss. But if again, if if there are any questions, of course, please full, feel free to put them on the chat or we will have a Q&A session in the end. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, if we are looking at the legal education and the impact of AI on that, we cannot not look at how the legal industry is shifting. And the legal industry is uh, looking at implementation of AI, of course, in the law firm and legal practices, but also in the public sector and various startups and legal entrepreneurial uh, ventures that we see in this space today. So there is a lot of movement. Uh, I have done specific research on which innovations work and scale in different geographies. So there is an entire innovation and um, you know entrepreneurial aspect to AI and law, which I'm very happy to talk about as well in case if that is of, uh, that is of interest. But if we, strike, if we focus on how the legal industry is shifting uh, with the impact of AI, um, there is this paper I usually talk about and start with because it shows us where we stand in terms of um, the changes uh, that we are expecting in the coming years. So, for example, uh, this paper from 18th of March 2023, so it's also already quite dated. Things are changing so fast in the matter of weeks that a year is also already quite old. But it tells us where... Um, the legal profession will be in terms of an industry exposed to AI uh, and the large uh, language models. This is a paper by uh, researchers at Princeton, University of Pennsylvania, and New York University. So if you see on your left-hand side, um, the number four is the legal services, which is where, yeah, it is one of the key top industry where AI impact will be seen very, very strongly. And also with the large modeling adjustment, you see uh, legal industries quite on the top. Um, there have been use and cries that yes, technology will replace lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, um, for many years now. But as I said uh, before, with AI, we see this quite uh, prominently. And there have been a lot of discourse. I'm sure you are all not kind of new to figuring out what news items we see around the impact of AI uh, on how legal services are shifting. The question is, will the lawyers be replaced? That's that's too, uh, how can you say, extreme a statement to make. But what skills will be required of tomorrow's lawyers? That is what we need to focus on. Um, no industry or, you know, especially a traditional industry like law cannot be completely dispensed or uh, replaced. But it's just that people will start requesting and demanding new things because base level of legal awareness or information will be available to a lot of people at scale, right? That is what a large language model does. And, and then we have to be very critical and very innovative to see how we can add value. So I wanted to also tell you a little bit about what the industry leaders think on this and what is the research that is kind of upcoming in uh, the space of, yeah, where do we sh see the, the trends shifting? So there's a report by Thomson Reuters, which says that, yeah, uh, on a survey that they organized, 80% of the law firm leaders believe that AI can be applied to legal work now itself. And, and more than 50% believe that it should be applied uh, in the coming times. So basically, there's an overwhelming majority of people who think right now it is relevant and in the future also uh, more so. So this is quite a telling number. So there are industry trends that we see here. And the, another research by Clio uh, kind of really gives out the use cases uh, for AI in legal services. So I've kind of put down some of them on the screens, but this is just a growing list. The beauty of the AI technology, as we know, is that we don't know what it can do. This is just the starting. So if we see that, okay, contract review, contract automation is here to stay, maybe for the next three to five years, but you know, we have to think even longer term than that. Um, organizations like OpenAI make it very clear as you enter on their website that they are, we are working towards artificial general intelligence. So what does that mean uh, for different industry? And then kind of zooming in again into the law, what implication it would have? 
uh, it requires us to have a broad and i'm going to take tell you a little bit more about the skills um, that are needed in this space but uh, if we see on the screen very quickly now at the moment what is happening um, according to clio is that contract review is very easily uh, looked at by ai contract automation so basically document generation uh, creation of different clauses and clause libraries uh, and automatically generating a draft at least the first draft uh, for lawyers to look at so that saves a lot of time in in kind of rewording and reinventing the wheel even with due diligence we see that you know ai can do the repetitive manual tasks so much more efficiently uh, without errors that human judgment at times can have uh, of course, there are issues around bias of AI, but then there are bias that human beings also have. So, you know, how we can weigh and how we can balance that. So these are huge questions uh, for us collectively to think. And the ethics around AI then becomes very critical as well. But uh, but for now, I mean, due diligence is definitely something that AI will be good at. E-discovery uh, and, and also legal research. Finding the right... Um, citations, finding the right information at the click of a button and more intelligently so is something that AI is already extremely good at. And AI also comes in various sizes and forms, right? There is, of course, these open sources which are available for free to use. Uh, and there are questions around hallucination of this. And we also feel that, you know, sometimes it makes up information which is not exactly true. Uh, and, and we will see in the coming slides as to what kind of uh, litigation is happening around it or what are the current conversations on this but at the same time if we are looking at it as just the first draft and if lawyers and law firms build their own cloud systems to put their own information on a, a specific ai that they use in-house uh, then indeed uh, it is a kind of more foolproof than what is available for free to use so there are um, different kinds of ai and we have to look at yeah what is the most optimum way to do legal research in terms of litigation strategy and litigation analysis analysis why this is important is because um one of the things ai is very good at is that from a large amount of data to do predictions and to come up, come up with tre trends and to see what patterns emerge that is really something that ai can do well Human beings at some point of time can kind of not take in more data. Maybe, of course, if we, we train our minds enough, we can. But that is some that takes a lot of hard work. Uh, compared to that, AI can kind of consume huge amount of data and see, okay, what kind of strategy should we adopt in a certain scenario or what are likely outcomes. Imagine if that starts happening at scale. Um, understanding the future patterns becomes so much more e so much easier and smoother. Uh, that perhaps better decision making can also start to happen right so um those are some of the use cases which which um, we can kind of clearly see ai benefiting the practice of law and this is just a growing list as i mentioned more will come uh, this is just the beginning of the use of artificial intelligence uh, that we see there have been naysayers, and I've seen them quite a lot saying, no, you know, technology is not completely going to replace the lawyers, and things are not going to change as easily as we think. But this time, you know, we see on the screen two examples, and uh, amongst a growing list, that there is an unprecedented uptake um, in large organizations to do basic uh, tasks, as I mentioned in my previous slide. Um, uh, and, and using AI for that. So Harvey, of course, many of you might know that PwC has started exp uh, experiments with different chatbots to speed up the lawyer. So these are in-house um, you know, tools that are being developed, not something external facing as yet. Ellen and Overy, an uh, uh, international law firm, also has introduced AI chatbot. And again, we are still talking of the legal industry at the moment. And, but please keep in mind what implications this is going to have for legal education as well and what skill then a human lawyers will do if the AI lawyers are already doing these tasks. Um, West Law has also uh, announced very recently that to do research um, in a more accurate way through the use of AI, uh, West Law precision is, is something that can assist human beings um, where we can simply ask a question in everyday language and then get a relevant answer um, 
based on what, of course, the repository uh, that is available with Westlaw. So you see um, the, the uptake and the implementation is already there. And uh, we see how this develops. And we have to constantly be vigilant and aware of things uh, shifting. Um, that is one of the skills that definitely comes to mind as I take you through these slides. But I, I of course, would like to talk to you a little more about what else would be needed. As I mentioned, AI is just the beginning and the legal sector <laughs> is ripe for a lot of innovation. Why I say this is that on your screen, what you see at the moment, and this is not typically a, a use case of AI, but use case of where technology can go. What most of you, and of course, it's a very normal intuitive assumption that this is just a bunch of code and bunch of uh, kind of, you know, computer language on the screen. Um, but then those who are familiar with this technology would know that this is a smart contract, uh, which is where uh, if you can read the code, you will be able to say that this is a, a transaction to exchange 10,000 Bitcoins uh, from one uh, party to another. So there is a crypto transaction that is taking place. And how these trustless systems develop is where, you know, execution of the contract is automatic upon certain conditions being met. That means that the entire process or procedure of creating and drafting of different documents and making sure that they are executed between two parties and the need for the lawyers is completely kind of uh, done away with uh, by computer. So on one hand, this is, and this was some years ago already, and more and more changes are coming in this space. Again, when we are talking about intersection of law and technology, one way is, of course, to see how technology is replacing um, some of the legal tasks. But the new tasks that are coming up for lawyers, when you see this, is that there's going to be a need for regulation. There's going to be a need for more policies and guidelines for using this technology in day-to-day -day basis um, and to make sure that they are safe to use and adapt and scale, right? So um, there is going to be a huge need for people who can come up with innovative ideas around drafting of policies, around drafting of guidelines, around understanding how technology works to come up with suitable uh -huh. and laws um, around that. Uh, but having said that, the key task of drafting of documents and making sure that they are signed, etc., they, are, they may no longer be as needed or be effective. And for that to see, so you need to understand how technology works. So that's another skill set that is coming. And we will see um, how that also forms part of the list of what law students should be aware of going forward. Um, I put this slide specifically with these two pictures because on one hand, you see how fast technology trends are uh, shifting. But on the other hand, the legal education or legal information is presented in a way which is still in, in kind of form of uh, these books that we see for, uh, in front of us. Um, this is the way things are at the moment. And it, it needless to be said that it will shift. Um, you know, the information that we see in, this, uh, in, in these books, even as legal professionals, sometimes it is daunting. Uh, and sometimes you feel there is just a lot for us to go through and a lot for us to review to come up with a specific answer. Naturally, if there is a technology which can aid us and assist us in finding the relevant information that we are looking at from this uh, kind of way information is presented, it is definitely going to find a strong uptake. But then also think about the larger perspective of people for whom laws are written and people who are, you know, day to day users or, 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 you know, people who see the impact on their own lives. That means the citizens, that means people, you know, doing basic um, tasks, but would need law, would need to understand what rights affect them or what are some of the basic laws that they should be aware of. For them to look at this information is almost impossible. Uh, people hesitate to interact with lawyers. Let's be honest. There's a fear when they have to go to the court. Perhaps that can kind of be replaced by ease in which technology operates. Uh, there are going to be huge scalable models around kind of replacing this daunting information in easier, palatable, plain language, or even visualized information for people at large. And again, thinking through how lawyers or people with law legal insights can benefit or kind of create their value in this space. Um, 
moving on it's just not you know this conversation up in the air but there are tangible uh, evidences and statements and people at very high level talking about this so under secretary general uh, sorry De deputy secretary general of uh, united nations um recently made the statement that digital technologies really provide innovative ways for people to seek and obtain redressal um through of course both formal and informal justice institutions so um as as you know somebody who thinks futuristic what opportunities do you see here for yourself how do you think you can add value when these statements are being made from the top and how you can kind of make yourself really really uh, relevant and this is a high level kind of um view or or vision that is being given and then that is be, being made tangible by the numbers here uh, that just by 2025 so by next year itself uh, ai and machine learning are going to drive huge amount of business value and this is a study by deloitte so you see that this is going to really take shape extremely quickly and the business is moving towards that so as lawyers or law students if we see which way the trends are shifting indeed it is through understanding how ai and machine learning work um if if business uh, and clients are going to start adopting this then of course there's going to be and there will have to be a strong kind of reaction in the legal space as well um this is a quote that i really like uh, because when i kind of ask myself this question or see this conversations all around me uh, chat gpt came up with this very interesting quote which says where and when i asked it that you know um, what kind of uh, skill sets will human beings need uh, and how they will be relevant in terms of the growing machine use uh, chat gpt came up with this quote that where human intuition meets machine precision the poten potential for greatness unfolds so see it's already quite uh, intelligent in figuring out where the right synthesis will lay um, as i mentioned what i asked chat gpt is important to know what the answer was so that is the entire science of prompt engineering that is where you really need to ask the right questions and kind of try to get and seek the right kind of information from chat gpt it is not a thinking machine it is just the right kind of you know code that will make uh, it generate a specific answer from the data that it, it has been given so there are huge amount of jobs and potential in prompt engineering already so you see that it's not that people are being replaced it is newer jobs are being created with people who can really adapt and change and learn those skill sets uh, fairly quickly so what key skill sets are necessary for tomorrow's lawyers when we see all of this um, shifting and this is not a new conversation to have there are people already predicting this people already writing about this again if you have interest there is huge amount of literature out just on google for you to find out and one of my favorite authors actually several but one of them that i would like to mention today is professor richard saskind he has been writing relentlessly about the need and many of you already might know about uh, his work is that you know how lawyers will need to be made relevant in the years to come um so his first book there have been several i think this is not the first book but one of his books is called tomorrow's lawyers i think this was one of the earlier ones called the end of lawyers question mark also a fascinating read if this is not in your library you should already kind of try to find it if not he has some free articles on harvard business review and other places that i highly encourage you to read what he has to say he has been working in the space of law and tech as i mentioned so rethinking the nature of legal services already things are outlined as to what will be relevant and then it's not just that the private sector or the law firms are going to shift but the online courts uh, is also something that we have to uh, you know uh, kind of bring it in our consciousness online dispute resolution especially i know in india is a huge kind of you know emerging field and so many newer startups are coming in this space uh, the you know great potential for public private partnership uh, is being synthesized where can you find relevance in that you know how you can add value there so that's again something that um, i encourage you to look at in in real small like you know in bullet points and in nutshell just like a chat gpt uh, generated answer this is not chat gpt generated but basically um, 
what Professor Satskin is trying to say is that more changes are going to come in the legal profession and than what we have seen in the past two centuries. And this is quite an apt statement. Legal profession has been quite steady and quite, uh, how can you say, stable for the last several decades. In a way, this is not a bad thing because when people go to lawyers and legal system, they would expect some stability, some predictability. But again, the delays that it comes with, the bureaucracy and the kind of paperwork, etc., may not be ideal. So those are the places where things will be replaced. Uh, then one of the other things that he's saying that, you know, we are at a period of fundamental transformation where technology will start playing a critical role. Again, when you're seeing these statements, try to think entrepreneurially uh, where you, what will you will need. But uh, this is, uh, I think this is quite intuitive now. We don't have to question it or think about it. It is happening. The future is already here, as some of them say. Another interesting statistic um, is that, you know, law. when people think about the laws and the legal system, we think about the courts, we think about the lawyers, we think about police, the regulators, the big institutions. But at the end of the day, uh, it's the people who really need and organizations who need access to legal information. And what is going to be a game changer is that more people in the world now already have internet access or access to technology than access to justice. So there's a huge gap uh, of what kind of services are needed in this space. Perhaps not always as a charity, huh? not always as an NGO model when you hear the word access to justice. People will pay for it, at least, you know, right? reasonable amount to enforce or at least understand uh, their, the legal information that can help them and guide uh, through the problem that they are facing or even organizations. So again, there's a huge opportunity to come up with innovative solutions in this space. A um, lot of things are available at the click of a button. Uh, you know, the food that we order or the clothes or the books we want to buy or things that we order online. Similarly, what kind of services will be needed for uh, in the in the legal space, what can be available at a click of a button? We see a lot of people asking their questions online on Google or on different uh, uh, you know portals. Sometimes, unfortunately, they get the wrong information or not are not directed to the right sources. So, what could be reliable trust creating? Trust is going to be a huge thing for people to develop trust in an online service or something that can bring technology even in house within the legal departments or in the law firms or for people at large. So there is, again, a huge opportunity here. And now thinking about this, again, Professor Saskin and other uh, people who have done a lot of research in this space, where do they see opportunities for innovative lawyers and legal professionals? So I think this could also be relevant for some of you. There is going to be a struggle for those unwilling or unable to adapt. Um, those who can embrace technology and innovative service delivery will succeed. Unfortunately, what we study at times in the law schools is still quite uh, of the past decades. Law and technology is an area where I strongly suggest, and you're going to be seeing in one of my slides later on, is to really start having these conversations in the law space, uh, in, in the legal education space, because there's going to be very difficult times ahead for those who will not know how to use technology. Unfortunately, those who are in the elder generation find it more difficult, but sometimes it's not always age relevant, right? Anyone who is very open-minded to learn how things work will succeed or able to empathize. And that's what we are going to be seeing on what the clients want, what the users are demanding. So yeah, it's, it's time for all of us to really kind of continue to update ourselves. Need for those who can think outside of the box uh, in offering high quality legal service, because there's going to be a strong demand the geographical boundaries are also shrinking. That would mean that you be are competing with the best of the best uh, at any given time. So when your services are made available online or when you're using technology, uh, how much can you think outside of the box? How, how much you can connect the different dots and offer something which is of superior quality compared to those who are also in this space? Um, one of the things that is very relevant is understanding innovation and entrepreneurship, how economics work, how business work, uh, that combined with offering of the legal service is going to be a, a game changer or a, quite a cutting edge service that lawyers can offer. So that those are two important skill sets. Not everybody has to be an entrepreneur. Huh? Not everybody has to start their own organization. Maybe it's not for everyone, but at least having that beginner's mindset or curiosity of how things are shifting, that itself is enough. You don't have to kind of completely change direction because things are changing. 
be good in what you do and understand what the bigger picture is. That is critical. Um, one of the things that um, is relevant is to, to know that clients will also start having a lot of information for themselves. When we go to doctor, for example, first we also Google and find out, okay, what can I find for myself online from the information that is available for free? Similarly, clients also do that. Users also do that. Uh, with artificial intelligence giving very clear and good answers, clients will start asking more intelligent questions. They will start thinking, okay, how best can this legal profession professional um, uh, understand me or support me in my need? One of the things that I always hear uh, lawyers say when you start talking about technology is that, no, no, lawyers will always have the soft skills. We will always be in demand for, um, you know, having the one-on-one -on -one human interaction. But you might be surprised to know that there are really good AI tools which are so empathic and sometimes are also used in therapy in different parts of the world because human beings cannot only other human beings can only offer so much empathy but which is something that is available 24/7 and can also be programmed to be extremely uh, you know sensitive to the human interaction that they are having uh, they are kind of tr trumping some of our soft skills too one of the examples is called pi.ai you should check it out and, and it's a very interesting way in which AI starts to communicate with human beings. So if we think that this is something that is a, only going to be a human forte, um, yeah, that is something uh, you might want to reconsider really uh, and very happy to kind of think through with you more. But what is going to be really relevant is to Kind of connect the different dots and one of the other researchers from stanford who is doing great work and a lot of her work is online and in use is used in different parts of the world is called margaret hagan at stanford design school and one of her key expertise is looking at you know lawyers as designers lawyers are often thought to be solution provider you go to the you know client comes to you and as a lawyer you are supposed to just give these solutions saying this section this section applies this law this is what you should do i advise you to do this and clients will often believe because you know that's this power dynamic there is this um you know you really trust the lawyer but designers on the other hand start to design everything based on you know who's using that product and how um their service or product will be utilized uh, by the client. So that is something that we need to change in terms of the mindset that uh, we have to co-create uh, with our clients. So looking at the, the designer uh, mindset, technology and law. So that kind of unique combination will be quite relevant. That's something maybe technology will not be as good uh, to do. Maybe it is, but for now, indeed, uh, that mindset shift is is something that seems extremely relevant. So what uh, Professor Hagan says is that you need to build a new skill set or a new set of professional paths and opportunities for lawyers. That is something that we need to be more aware of. We need to do consciously as, as legal educators or people in this field because they will be needed. Um, to generate how you can serve clients better, uh, different lawyers and law firms better, or general public in newer ways, it could be through technology or maybe it's not, you know, newer things that we can offer could be either and building ideas for viable products and businesses. So that is something that you need to be thinking through more forward thinking and creative generation of solutions. Keep the focus on clients. As I mentioned very quickly, I wanted to talk to you about human centered design, because when you are talking a lot around technology and how AI is shifting things coming back to the human problems and how they are going to be solved. Uh, again, there's a huge amount of literature on how human-centered design thinking or human-centered centered problem sol solving techniques, putting people at the center of even technology development, of creating the products and services that resonate with your audience. That is going to be uh, quite critical. Yes, I see some hands. I will conclude in the next 10 minutes and perhaps we can take questions after that. Uh, because then I would finish all of the, what I want to say. I hope that is okay. Uh, and then the human-centered design. Yeah, I mentioned this all earlier, but business uh, consulting companies are already using this. And this is something that is definitely going to have ripple effects in the field of law. 
So that now coming to the legal education, hopefully you have seen some of the dots of uh, how law um, is kind of, you know, uh, what kind of changes and skill set requirements are needed from the legal educators, uh, but specifically so. Um, there are conversations around, yes, GPT-4 beating 90% of the lawyers to pass the bar in the US. So yeah, it, it has, what does that mean for us? That means that there's a lot of information already available with GPTs. Uh, to kind of capture and encapsulate the lot of legal information and coming up with the right answer. So that it can already do. We need to think of better ways then uh, to create what will qualify a good lawyer to be providing good service. But then there are also these questions, right? So that jury is still out on this one. The fact that chat GPT hallucinates, it comes up with wrong cases. It kind of, you know, misdirects at times uh, to what is not the right answer. And there have been people who've been debarred from just cut, copying and pasting from um, a chat GPT answer in one of the petitions. So that is not the right thing to do. As, you know, it's intelligent people, we should at least double check what the chat GPT or any uh, generative AI tool that you're using is generating. So. Uh, jury is still out on kind of how intelligent it is or how much it, it hallucinates, but the answer is not in the extreme. The answer is somewhere in the middle, somewhere where kind of we figure out how things are shifting, we shift with it, but being very, very cautious, designing our policies, designing our kind of training programs, etc. So the question is, yeah, to, to use chat GPT or to not use a chat GPT, especially in legal education, especially in different universities, how do we train our young minds today? And whether this is going to be a necessary skill set or not, like it or not, people use chat GPT or other LLMs that are going to be there. That means that to be on a competitive edge or to have that advantage with your peers and with the competitors, you will have to see what they are doing. And to stay one step ahead of the game, maybe it is relevant to understand, not completely ban it. Um, I found this really interesting statistic, but, but again, this is dated six months old uh, or more. Uh, 100 US universities policies on AI. Yeah, this is, and things have shifted. Even in my own universities, uh, a strong kind of guideline is being prepared for the use of uh, open um, uh, you know, source models or, or generative AI models. So 50%, 50, more than 50% are letting the individual instructors decide. Uh, some explicitly ban it and some have not clear policy. But um, yeah, there are some, as you see in the green, 4% allowed with citation unless instructors disallow. So that's like by default. And I think this is uh, the growing category where, uh, of course, there are guidance coming, but especially imagine, you know, university teaching codes. Some of my colleagues or friends who are teaching uh, technology in, in different universities say that Generative AI is excellent in coming up with bug-free codes. Um, so that means, will the coders be re replaced or what will be the, their task to do? So those are also questions that they are facing. It's not just the lawyers or legal education institutions who are at, there is a, these are common problems. But again, there is there is a shifting trend on using AI, using chat GPT in um, educational institutions, but being very careful that you're sending all of the data to um, to open AI. So very strong data protection policies or kind of creating something in-house on your own cloud, on your own information platforms is something that might be a wiser approach for now. But you see, um, very recently, this news article came out that uh, Arizona State University in the US is having collaboration with open AI. Huh? So that, that this means that using ChatGPT enterprise across the university in enhancing teaching, learning, and discovery. This is quite an interesting development. With artificial intelligence, what happens is that every individual has a unique con communication assistant. That means you can teach students based on exactly what they need to learn and how they prefer learning. This is, co this is called the metacognitive skills, how people learn. And if AI is used in higher education in customizing education to each individual or each student based on their um, you know, level of expertise or interest or, or capacity, that means that you are really shifting the needle here. This is just the first example, I think, but more might be coming. You never know. Uh, but that definitely shows that OpenAI is interested and more AI companies will also come up in the future. Again, 
um, what this means for legal education, what this means for lawyers. Again, the jury is out, uh, but we have to keep an open mind. This is happening. This is happening. So what are some of the legal tasks? This is for legal educators now to think uh, what generative AI can do very, very well. And then how do we respond as people in the law around it? So drafting. A generative AI is going to be extremely good at drafting. Not a lot of law students like drafting, maybe. Maybe a lot, lot of them like as well. But this creates an amazing first draft, at least as we discussed. Um, then there are, you know, really good research tools already available around um, uh, with the use of generative AI that it can do really well as well, coming up with uh, some of the first level of uh, drafting of research and some of the communication as we saw Harvey and as we saw Westlaw Precision, internal communication, uh, helping lawyers in-house to find the right answers or kind of to tell them where to look or to guide them in the right direction. Even some of the legal bots that we see on some of the lawyer, law firm websites, just the low hanging fruit, the first information is collected. This is where generative AI is also very good at in customer communication. And then if things are more complicated, you refer them to the right person in the organization. So some of the stakeholder communication, again, a legal task that uh, generative AI can do quite well. So training the lawyers and and. Uh, you know, future legal professionals in, in keeping this in mind is going to be critical. And last couple of slides, and then I'm very happy to take the questions on some of the takeaway for law students and legal educators. If you are a law student, what you should do and how you should adapt and kind of learn from um, what is happening. First, think about how relevant is my current range of skills, um, especially at the moment how I'm able to add value, how I'm able to stay relevant in kind of looking at the tasks which are coming before me. Is it good? But then keep in mind what skills will be needed from the legal professionals in the next three to five years. How good am I to am I in predicting this? Have conversations with your colleagues, have conversations uh, with your friends from different industries as well and ask them, you know, what would you need from legal professionals and how can I learn quickly? Will this mean learning coding? Uh, maybe. Maybe you need to kind of just understand how Python code works. And then again, ask Chat GPT. It is there to guide you through uh, through kind of understanding it, self-learning. And kind of something that all of us can do is no longer an excuse not to do. We all have to update our skill set on a going basis. Um, yes, that is something which uh, we have to prepare ourselves for. Again, another skill that is going to be relevant is creating those draft policies and guidelines around the use of new technologies. Data protection is going to be extremely important. Privacy-related conversations, ethics, and responsible AI is also going to be a very, very dominant conversation already. I mean, if not in the next few months or years. So how can I learn this quickly is something that uh, is what you need to think about. Again, just focusing on law may not be enough, unfortunately. A lot of times our legal education really, really drills down all the right sections, all the right legal provisions, but maybe AI will be so good at doing now. So how am I updated about what is happening in the outside world, about other related sectors? Where can I add expertise or where can I combine, uh, combine my legal information and knowledge with different sectors? Uh, that's where you start to add value because then your thinking pattern is little more open-minded than just the legal thinking mind, which is critical, which is analytical, and which is great. But is it creative enough to think through the future? You need to think to think about this, right? How thorough is my understanding of technology? We talked about this. This is no escape. You need to familiarize yourself, like it or not. Yeah, adapt is the time. And how thorough is my understanding of the nature of the legal problems people and organizations experience? This is a very critical one. You can no longer think, okay, you know, I this is how things have always been and this is how it will continue to be. No, try to empathize with your clients and organizations that you work with. How uniquely can you solve? I think we are we can think through uh, quite, you know, innovatively at times as well through communications and teamwork. So, that again, discussions with different people from different sectors, um, that is really going to be critical. Um, and then if you're a legal educator, what do, you, um, what do you need to think through? I would say all of the above, future-proofing yourself, 
um, all the law, legal educators also have to think about how relevant their skill sets are and how good they are in future proofing uh, the skill sets of their students. So also thinking about how I can future proof the skill sets of my students. What is industry relevant? That is also a critical one. Uh, what will the industry require of the legal professionals and how I can already include this in my curriculum? Um, AI is one of them, but then again, there are a huge aspects of cybersecurity that one needs to be uh, aware of. These are issues happening uh, of cybersecurity fraud. So how, as, as legal professionals, can we respond to that? Data protection and privacy is another one. Uh, biotechnology is another one. So technology, there is, you know, regulation technology or fin technology already there. Uh, but agriculture technology, healthcare technology. So where are some of these areas where I can... Uh, have these discussions in the classrooms already, if not now, and how fast we can deploy a course on law and technology if we do not have it already in our curriculum. I think all the law schools should already have this at multiple levels, starting from year one to year five, uh, because I'm sure internships, you see a lot of use of it coming uh, when you are practically working on the ground. And again, the last one is how multifaceted our curriculum already is. Are we just thinking about law all the time or how we can make it industry relevant uh, and give a little broader picture uh, about the world around us as, as legal educator? So I guess on one hand, um, we see a huge amount of technology coming, but there are still access to justice issues and understanding of the clients. So bringing these two worlds together is going to be, I would say, capturing the AI and legal education talk. I am going to kind of, I have some examples to talk about, but I know that you have some questions as well. So I think in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to um, welcome any questions or thoughts or suggestions that you have for me. And uh, yes, thank you for your patient listening. Kanan, I have to say that was a brilliant session. It was really insightful. And uh, as a consumer, not only for moderating this session, but as a consumer of uh, legal knowledge and everything, this was really nice. I mean, thank you. PPD with all the current up to date, uh, you know, um, images that you used and the news clippings, it, it was really relevant. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, for, for the questions, you've already covered some of the questions that we had received uh, during registration from our attendees. We'll just quickly go to go over to the chat box to see if um, there are some. One I saw and one which we received earlier also was uh, there are a lot of curious people on uh, is there a career solely in um, artificial intelligence law or can they shape their career um, some way in using AI or uh, in the field of AI as such? Is there AI law? Do you see it coming? I think that's a very good question because we will see a lot of uh, need for technology use um, across. So mm -hmm. if you familiarize yourself with data protection or privacy or those kind of conversation, then I can imagine that there is a huge role for uh, technology lawyers or people who could mix different disciplines, especially at the intersection of law and technology. So. If that is an area of your interest, I would say, why not? But then be really good at technology because a lot of people from the technology uh, field are also interested in law, right? And they bring with themselves a lot of insight around how softwares work and how coding happens. And so then you have to start being very, very good at how AI. I would wish to kind of, you know, uh, I have to say in my beginning slides, I started to include information around how AI works, what AI is and what AI can do. But then, you know, we had limited time and there is so only so much I can cover, but please go through the entire technology then, then be very, very good at it. Um, I would say that there's a huge scope um, in that. Imagine there's going to be also a huge scope in space law, also huge yes. scope in, um, you know, biotech. So if these are the areas of your interest, then feel free to kind of start pursuing it very, very seriously. Um, and then world is your canvas, because for some of these issues, you don't need just the geographical uh, specific mm -hmm. understanding. So you can be quite international. Sorry, I can go on, but I want to also take <laughs> other questions. That's fine. So then, like you mentioned, uh, you'll be surprised that we not only have lawyers or law students here for the session, we got a lot of interests from uh, from people who are in science and even though this is on legal education 
but we were very happy that uh, uh, we received such you know uh, participation from uh, from the attendees so another question and uh, i saw two of the same was uh, do you suggest any reading material on uh, ai maybe as a you know ready reference hmm. this is a very good question i think there is going to be some book on ai for dummies there is something there is a book called uh, um just basics of ai i think there is something around this but you know just go online start reading multiple sources that would that is what i would do mit has great source on generative ai so mm -hmm. mit is one source i think stanford uh, design school also has started a lot of conversations around privacy so i would say at least mit and stanford are doing very very good work um then there are of course blogs by richard suskind which i already mentioned so these are the reading material i would really request you to read if you have not already i think ai is just not for lawyers or uh, legal educators but for everyone and i'm so glad to know that there is interest from people of other disciplines too because at the end of the day laws and legal information is something that we all need to be aware of unfortunately a lot of people who experience legal problems end up learning laws themselves thinking how i can understand my problems best and solve them for them this is a great opportunity uh, to start kind of thinking what tools we can use to simplify um, the, our understanding so i'm so glad that there is cross sectoral interest that's great so um, another question that i see is someone's asking a practical example of how a lawyer learning a language uh, python you had mentioned that the learning of coding and everything could become imperative for a lawyer to to be to learn to be relevant yeah so, so how how they can learn i mean there are really nice youtube videos so one of the things that we did in our law school is to ask student in their third years to make their own llm make their own gen ai now with really? chat gpt yeah and we kind of uh, threw them in the deep end and then they figured it out there are and of course we had it faculty to guide them and take the workshops etc but the extra things that they learned on their own on on youtube so that beginning beginners mindset is extremely critical but if you use chat gpt 4 um you can make your own um uh, uh, llm there it's so simple to make and i highly request you to re recommend wow. you to you spoken that. like a true educator that you know you threw them under the bus and then they learned how to uh, yeah. do everything and it's not only what the solution they came up with it's the things that uh, how they did it that helped them uh, that helped the learners grow yes That's so um a few questions were very uh, you know um, legal area specific like what is the role of ai in let's say odr or uh, in intellectual property um, mm. is there is there an answer that you could you know just uh, because i think going into every specific area will be problematic so yeah. um, that that just benefits people from different arenas no definitely i think uh, odr and intellectual property are really important areas especially also from the perspective of uh, generative ai because see a lot of conversations even in the eu ai act and th i think that's also a fantastic text to look at eu has come up with really good guidelines on their ai act online so feel free to just check this that out but one of the key contention has been data and one of the key contentions why data has been is because of the intellectual property issues whose copyright is it and you must have heard about open ai being sued by new york times exactly yes, on yes. intellectual property aspects so you know familiarizing yourself with how copyright issues ip issues Ma. and ai will happen yeah, so that is also know. extremely important and with odr yeah, i'm very very excited on. about how online dispute resolution is happening i have some great examples of how public sector agencies are um yeah i think somebody has shared a whiteboard I'll just I'll just check now. Yeah, but any which ways I would say yeah, there are some great I mean, examples of public sector case. agencies um, using uh, ODR mechanisms, and this is going to exponentially help them create solutions at doorstep of people. Um, so I would say there is a huge uh, potential for combining AI and ODR in simplifying, um, you know, dispute resolution. Courts are doing this. Mediation right. will be so much easier. i can go on entrepreneurial thinking mind <laughs> people will find this a great opportunity 
I think in India, one more, one more thing I would say, sorry about this, but we have some amazing technology universities also. And I think their IITs are doing some great work around coming up with Gen AI solutions. So collaborating with them, understanding Correct. what is happening there uh, is very important. Sometimes, you know, left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So um, that would be important to do. Coming up that's with hackathon, coming just... up with competition. Sorry, I can go on. No, no, that's great. Actually, the, everything that you're saying is so relevant. And it's so good to know because all of this is actually happening. We're not just talking about theory, We're not talking about something that's, that happened 30 years ago. It's happening right uh, when we speak. Exactly. So I there's... have a question, sorry, about no. ju uh, judges using uh, AI. And, you know, there are some researchers I know in South America who are already studying how AI is used by judges. Um, and they are doing controlled trials around this. And judges are openly saying, you know, we are using some of it for drafting purposes, for research purposes, and how much more efficient they are. Of course, it's not always right. But as I said, the first draft aspect, you cannot ignore that. And there are studies which show that there's so much more efficient process involved because it cuts the a workload of judge into, you know, half, if not more already. So um, this is proliferating. Again, the data safety issue and privacy would come into place because law and justice delivery is a very sensitive area. So it's really kind of making sure that people's data is not misutilized. There are no kind of uh, vulnerabilities as far as cybersecurity threats are concerned. That is, of course, very, very important, which technology tools that we use but um, yeah, so I would say that there's a huge opportunity for dispute uh, resolution and the use of AI by judges. Sorry, I saw that question to be quite relevant. It, it was. And you've just, I think, stepped on something that we received as a question from multiple people, but was something that we are, we are going to definitely take in the next session, which is for law practice and legal professionals. Is yes. uh, A lot of people asking, is AI going to take our jobs? No, as I said, AI is not completely going to take your job. There's not much to worry about. No, I'm just saying it's not going to completely replace, but the skill set needed will be shifting and thinking about your client's needs is something maybe chat GPT doesn't have as much access to as you have. So think yeah. and empathize with them. That is critical. I think you're going to have to, uh, again, uh, go over this question in our next session because yeah. this is definitely one of the most relevant questions. And that I understand that happens with technology. Every new technology and everyone starts thinking that, oh, how is it going to take away my job or how is, how is it going to affect the professional life? However, how we how we see AI is it's a, it's an it's a tool. It's it's a, it just enhances the experience. It it helps us, like you said, it's helping the judges. It helps the lawyers. It helps so uh, the students. But really, it's is transformational. Right. Exactly. If you see how you know sometimes one file to take it from the right registry to the judge's office is also some takes so much longer time. Imagine if it's a digitally enabled that it takes a matter of seconds and. It really helps clients a lot, especially in the public sector. So, yeah, there is a great use case there. Of course, being very cautious about data is important. But yeah. I think there's a lot of worry about the job replacement. You're very right. And I'm very happy and excited to include that in the next conversation on 29th February. Some of the questions are now centered around legal professionals and uh, LLM training and all of that. So um, I think we've, uh, we've reached the uh, reached our time limit as well. So yeah. um, and thank you again for such a great session and for being so up in front with all our questions and everything. And we, we are very glad that we'll be doing the next session together as well. So um, thank you for the participants as well. We'd love to yeah. have you again for the next yeah. session. Thanks, Kanan. Thank you very much. And I hope you had a good session. Thank have you. a nice thank rest you. of the day. You too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Peace. In New York. Times case. The New York Times case, yes, please look it up. Basically, New York Times, New York Times case versus the open AI. Yes, the New York Times has sued open AI saying that they have plagiarized our, our articles uh, and are kind of a open um, chat GPT's verbatim replacing it uh, or kind of coming up with it. And that would, would it be an infringement of copyright of uh, New York Times? So that is ongoing right now. But there are very interesting legal arguments on both sides. So I think the information should be online. Check it out. There are blogs also written on it, and it's quite contentious. But yes, that is kind of summing up <laughs> the last question. Thank you for your curiosity. Please be curious. That is the most important thing in the right. world that we are going to face. 
okay i'm going to sign off now <laughs> okay thank you so much karan thank you thank you thanks everyone for joining in